So the Fourier theorem says the following. Um, if I have an object, I can take, of course, the two-dimensional Fourier transform, and then I end up with this. And again, so here in the center is the TC point. This is the mean of the entire image. And then everywhere else are frequencies along this axis are the signs oscillating horizontally along this axis are the signs and cosines oscillating vertically. If you, if you compute an image like this and you show it on your screen, actually all you see is this white dot in the center. So I raised it to the power 0.2 or 0.3 or something. So you can't see something because these values are typically very, very small compared to the mean value. Now of this, we assume that the gamma camera, PET camera or a CT, that they will pro compute projections, which we organize as parallel beam projections. So we compute parallel beam projection, we get this. Now we can take a one dimension of Fourier transform that will produce this. And then the Fourier, Fourier theorem or Fourier slice theorem says that this is the central profile here in the same direction as this projection. So if I project oblique here, then the profile I will obtain is along that same oblique line. So it is actually very easy to prove. And I did that in the course. So if you have a look there, the proof is pretty trivial, especially uh, for projections along X or Y, there is almost nothing. But intuitively, um, you can understand it with the, the, the representation that I showed before. So again, these are all these two dimensional sines and cosines. They oscillate in different directions. They can have a different amplitude, a different frequency, and a different phase. And so if we take a Fourier transform, we say that we're going to rewrite this like the sum of all these um, sinograms. And so all these things are linear. So a projection of this equals the projection of each of these guys. And if we add then all these projections, we should get this. So we compute the projections of all of these. We add it together and we will obtain this. But as you can see, the, the projections of signs oscillating horizontally in this case, they, are, they will survive the projection. And basically, you will get exactly the same sign, but now as a one dimensional profile, okay? because all these values are identical. But signs that oscillate in a different direction, they will integrate to nothing. So if they, if they are not nicely aligned with my projection view, the integral will always be zero. So that means that I don't need to bother about these guys. I can just uh, consider only the horizontal, horizontally uh, oscillating signs. Now I can also have a look at the Fourier transform of this thing and write it as this image. And then the horizontal, horizontal uh, signs and uh, cosines, they are just along this line. And so basically this thing says, okay, well, you can find how, how many of these horizontal uh, signs and cosines you need. You can find that here. Or you can first project them and then take a one dimensional profile and then you can find it in this profile. So that means that this one dimensional thing equals a one dimensional thing. So again, this is just an intuitive explanation. For me, that helps. If it doesn't help you, if you prefer the mathematics, they're in the course, they're pretty straightforward. So don't hesitate to check it. Calculations are pretty simple. All right, yeah, so here is the projection. If you take the Fourier transform of this, then this line equals this thing. All right, <clears throat> so that means if we have an image and we compute a, a projection, we can take the one dimension of Fourier transform of that, then we get this profile. And we get, if we take, um, if we put that profile in an image, uh, along that same uh, direction of the projection, then we find this, this line already in a two-dimensional Fourier transform. So if we measure uh, these profiles over 180 degrees, we get enough lines to fill the entire 2D Fourier transform. And then all we have to do is to take the inverse 2D Fourier transform and the job is done. So that would be one way to reconstruct an image. Um, and that way actually works as I will uh, show you in a few slides. So another important ingredient of the back correction is the back correction, of course. 
Um, and here is another way to explain how, how uh, fit the back projection is working. And so consider a point source in the center of an image. And if we compute the sinogram of that, we will have a straight line. If I would have moved the source to the left, then the sinogram would start here and go there. Sorry, so now we have uh, a single view and all we measure, all we know about this, this view is that there is activity here. So that tells us that somewhere along this line, there must be activity, but we have no clue where along the line. So a poor man's solution is then to distribute it uniformly along the line and see what happens. And then we take another view and we do the same thing. So if we back project like that, then we get an interesting result because the, the maximum response of that back projection is exactly at the point where the point source was. But otherwise the image is very bad because it's non-zero everywhere, right? And we have these lines everywhere. And if we have enough lines, we fill up the entire space. So there is no zero in this image and this image is zero everywhere. So these images are definitely not the same. And if we take a, a profile here, you, you see that you get a peak in the center, which is good. That's where the point source was, but we get a very wide uh, distribution here. So we can say, if we have an unknown image and we acquire uh, a sinogram with a, a PET or a, a SPECT system, then we get uh, this image, which we can consider a smoothed version of the original image, right? So we're going to have to do some unsmoothing. And that unsmoothing, that is the ramp filter. Okay, so this back correction uh, suppresses frequencies more if they are higher. And the inverse of that is this ramp filter. Um, one way to show that this is, we have all these projections. A point in the middle that was forward projected and now gets back projected. So we have all these lines. Oops. So if we now draw a circle with radius R here, And we, if we run along that circle, then we will always see the same activity independent of radius r. And the reason is that we cross always all these same lines and they bring us the same activity. So that means that the uh, activity along the r, so if we say that the uh, activity per unit distance here is rho, then uh, that's the local activity uh, times two pi r is a constant. And that means that rho equals a divided by two pi r. So that means that the profile that we saw, that the result after the back correction, is just one over r. Okay. And now it happens that the inverse Fourier transform of two-dimensional, so the 2D inverse Fourier transform of this profile is one over F. And one way to explain that, um, Um, so, you know, for a back projection, we have this line, and we have many lines like that, and they're all going to happen, right? And a Fourier transform is um, a linear thing. So, what I can do is instead of first adding all the lines and then taking the Fourier transform, I can take the Fourier transform of that line and put it here. And then I take the Fourier transform of the next line and I add it. And if I add all these Fourier transforms line by line, I should get the same result. You agree? Okay, so what is the Fourier transform of a line? It is, if this is a DC point, it is this line. 
And the reason is that to generate a line in this direction, there is no variation vertically. There is only variation horizontally. So I, I only need horizontally oscillating signs and I need signs of all possible frequencies to generate this line, right? So that means this line in space makes this line, oh, makes this line in the Fourier transform. And this line makes this line, right? So if I have all the lines here, I'm gonna have all the lines here. And if I add all the lines here, I get one over R. Therefore, if I get all the lines here, if I add them, I get one over this. All right. Yeah, and to, to unfilter one over F, you of course need F. So the RAM filter is the inverse of that scooting filter. Okay, so now we have uh, yeah, several ideas. We can combine them. So one thing we could do is we're gonna first do a back correction and then filtering. So suppose this is the image, but we don't know it. We only get this sign here. So now we compute back directions of that sign here. Take the first row and we back project it. We take the next row, we back project it. We continue like that. And after we're done, we get a very smooth image. And that smooth image is this image blurred by one over R everywhere. So now we can say, okay, one over R, we, it's in, uh, we can take the Fourier transform of that. So this is one over R. So in the Fourier transform, we're gonna divide by one over R and multiply with the Fourier transform of this point, which is basically a uniform uh, image because the Fourier transform of a Dirac impulse is a, uh, a flat distribution. All right, so I actually computed this, uh, in, in uh, IDL and applied it, and then you get this result. So if you look closely, you see it's not identical. So I really did it, but you see that it is close enough um, to say that this is a good reconstruction. If you would have more views, if you would have smaller voxels, the, the result would still be better. Okay. So this is straightforward application of what I just showed. So it works, but nobody's using it like that. Instead, everybody's using filter back correction, uh, meaning that the filter is not done after back correction, but it's done before the back correction. Okay, here is the recipe for MVP. <clears throat> so we start by writing our unknown distribution as uh, the inverse Fourier transform of its Fourier transform. So we assume that this big lambda here uh, and these are the frequency coordinates, but that is the two dimensional distribution of lambda. Therefore, we have to take the inverse Fourier transform, which is this exponent here, and we integrate over uh, the Fourier coordinates. All right? So this is the 2D Fourier transform of that one. So now we want to use the central slice theorem because we we will be given this sinogram. If we take a Fourier transform of this sinogram, then we have central lines through the Fourier image. So therefore, to be able to use these lines, we rewrite this uh, with different coordinates. We're gonna use uh, polar coordinates. So instead of nu x, nu y, we're gonna use theta and nu. And uh, we rewrite this integral then. So uh, that, that's done here. Um, so we have to replace new x, x, new y, y by this. And then the absolute value of the frequency shows up as the Jacobian of, of this transform. So if I integrate over the x, the, uh, over new x, new y, if I go from these coordinates to uh, polar coordinates, I have to uh, include the absolute value in this case of the frequency uh, as the Jacobian. Okay, and now the central line, we have it because we can take the Fourier transform along horizontal lines of the sinogram. So we rewrite it like that. So if I have my sinogram, I, then I can take uh, Fourier transforms along the horizontal line only. So the S coordinate uh, changes into a frequency, the theta we keep it. So this thing we have, therefore we insert it here in this expression. So we can replace this guy with this guy. <coughs> and that means that basically, if you look at this expression, the recipe says we need to take the Fourier transform of P to get the big P here. 
Then we have to multiply it by that Jacobian, which is the run filter. And then we have to take the inverse Fourier transform. And then we have to back project it. And that this is a back projection. You can again see we integrate over theta and uh, we, we pick as the spatial coordinate x cosinus theta, y sinus theta, which is a way to pick a projection uh, for a particular uh, angle. To pick a side angle, pixel along a row for a particular angle, which depends on x and y. All right. Is that clear or not? Okay, and so the, the process of taking the Fourier transform of P, multiplying it with absolute value of the frequency and then taking the inverse Fourier transform is by definition the round filter. As I previously explained, if you don't like Fourier transforms, you don't have to do it. You can compute it with convolutions too. And actually it's a pretty good approach. So the, in, in practice, it actually works better um, with the convolution last. If you do like Fourier transforms, it's actually better to take the spatial convolution mask and take the Fourier transform of that and use that as the RAM filter that works better than using the absolute value of mu. Well, mathematically they're equivalent, but they're only equivalent if you have infinitely many detectors, infinitely many angles. If you deviate from that, then both uh, approaches become an approximation and the spatial one turns out to be a bit better. Okay, so what do we have now? A new recipe. We take the sinogram and we first filter it. But I recall again, only along the rows, we keep the data. And the RAM filter is a filter that amplifies frequencies. So it works a bit like an edge detector. And uh, you see that the gray is zero here, the blacks are negative and the whites are positive, right? And it emphasizes all the frequencies as you can clearly see now, you see all the signs much better than before. All right, and now we start back projecting. So we take the first uh, rows here and we back project them. Again, the white stuff is positive and the black stuff is negative. And the negatives are designed to be delete excess positives that are coming from the other views. So it's actually amazing that this time can work. So we continue and you see that black and white start interfering more and more and in the end we get a nice image. So all the excess pluses have been deleted by the excess minus. If all goes well, there should be no negativity, negative values left because the whole thing is uh, tracer and concentration or activity, which is uh, non-negative. All right. Okay, all clear till here. Now, Johan, I have one question. Um, what about amplification filters? Right. So you just said that basically the RAM filter is in Fourier space. You multiply with the frequency, which of course amplifies all the noise, right? Mm -hmm. So can you say a few words about the yeah, well cu frequency cutoffs or amplification filters? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's correct. So you know that the sinogram normally, not this one, but a, a real sinogram is corrupted by Poisson noise. And Poisson noise is uncorrelated. And uncorrelated noise is also called white noise. It means it has all frequencies. So the noise in PET sinograms is, is not high frequency noise. It's just uncorrelated white noise. But as Georg just said, if we back project it, we amplify the high frequencies more. So that means that those propagate better into the image than the low frequencies. And as a result, the, uh, the noise in the reconstructions is high frequent noise. So for high frequencies, we have more noise. And indeed, if you take a noise sinogram and you apply filter back correction with the RAM filter, then you get uh, a lot of noise in there. So in the past, um, what people did was to combine this RAM filter here with an apodization filter. So they would, on top of that, for example, use uh, a butterworth, a having, a having anything that has uh, a value of one when nu is almost zero, and that has a value of zero near the frequency. But if you incorporate it here, then you get um, basically filter along the filter in the transactional plane, filter in the plane you're reconstructing, but you're not filtering in Z. And that gives pretty ugly images if you look uh, 
not in transaction images, but if you look in coronal and sagittal images, you see that they have been smoothed horizontally, not vertically. So in the past, um, this was done because the computers were uh, had very uh, small amounts of memory. But now memory is not a problem anymore. So it's much better um, to do filter back projection with the RAM filter and make sure that you do it a 3D smoothing. Now, there's many ways to do that. One would be to still manipulate the RAM filter a bit and uh, combine it with uh, a noise suppression filter, but then you should use a matched or more or less matched noise suppression filter in Z. Or you can just ignore the whole thing, make the RAM filter image anyway, and then post smooth it. So if you use floating point uh, calculation, it should make no difference. Uh, mathematically, both are equivalent. And a, a third approach is to smooth the sinogram first and then apply filter back correction to it. But again, uh, mathematically, that would be uh, exactly the same thing. All right. And then, yeah, depending on your taste, you have to design the filter. I've shown you that previously. Um, yeah. Any other questions? If not, then I will talk uh, briefly about analytical reconstruction in 3D PET, but not extensively. For two reasons, one is pretty complicated, and second, it's not uh, it's rarely used because iterative reconstruction is dominating the whole thing. Still, it's good, you know it exists, so if ever you need it, you know where to find it. So, as I said before, the or original PET scanners had these 2D septa. One reason is was to keep the amount of data limited because at that time there were simply no disks that could store all, all those data. And in addition, there were no algorithms to deal with uh, fully 3D uh, tomographic data. Fully 3D in this case means 4D, and because uh, data are four dimensional, while if we say 2D tomography is actually 3D. Okay, if we remove the septa, we get fully 3D data, we get all possible LORs. Now we could do the same thing. So we could say, okay, suppose there is a point source in the middle. And now we're gonna acquire a fully 3D sinogram of it. And then we back project it. We do exactly the same thing as before for every view, uh, for every uh, LOR, we, we back project what was seen along that LOR and we add the whole thing. Then we will get a hot spot here and non-zero values everywhere else. And now the, the, the shape will not be one over R anymore, but more like one over R squared. So if one over R is invertible, then one over R squared should definitely be invertible. And then we could just do what I said before. We could back project the whole thing and then filter, or we could figure out how to filter it first and then back project. But the problem is for um, filtering, if you do that in the Fourier domain or with convolutions, it needs to be shift invariant. We apply exactly the same thing everywhere. For a convolution, you could say, well, I could in principle use a different convolution kernel everywhere. That is true, but very complicated. In Fourier domain, that simply doesn't work. In the Fourier domain, you can only apply uh, shift invariant convolutions. And it's a problem because look what happens if I take this point source and I move it to the right. To do exactly the same thing, I would need these back projections. But that's not going to happen because we never measured these data. So that means if I back project, then I get different back projection point spread functions in my image, and therefore I cannot filter it with Fourier domain, with, uh, with, uh, with FFT. Okay, so what people do then is to, one of the solutions was to start with the 2D data. So we, we have, uh, we could play that we still had septa, ignore all the oblique LORs and just look at the straight LORs. They don't have this problem. So if we just back project as before in 2D uh, FBP, we can still make an image. But it's, uh, it's not gonna be a good image be because we ignored most of the data, but at least we have an image then. And with that image, we could compute the missing forward projections. Where, like we measured this one, but we never measured this one. But once we have an image, we can compute it. So that way we can synthesize the missing projections. And if we back project from the mixture of the data and all the synthesized missing projections, then we get the shift invariant um, response if we do the back projection. And once the response is shift invariant, we can figure out which filter to use 
to uh, the day. And so that algorithm has been popular for a while. Um, and the reason it, its popularity was limited is that it involves a two-step approach. You first need to make one reconstruction, then you need to do all this forward operation, and then you need back to do the back operation. So it's a bit more cumbersome than just uh, FEP-like algorithm. So its popularity declined once uh, Michel de Vriese proposed this Fourier ribbing, which I'm not going to explain in detail here. But the, the, the wonderful thing about it is that it transforms a 3D sinogram into a 2D sinogram. And the effect is like this. So we have all these lines here. And uh, he managed to find in the beginning an approximate expression to take information from this oblique line and put it in the blue lines. So near this pixel, information from all these black lines would be taken out the black lines and put in the blue line. And then you can see now we don't need the black lines anymore because the only reason they were there was to suppress the noise because they provide additional redundant information. But we incorporated that information in the blue line. So it's now the same as the black line. So we can throw away the black line. And that way he managed to convert the whole 3D sinogram, which is huge, into a 2D sinogram. And then we can apply good old 2D uh, reconstruction algorithms. And so what actually happened is that the, the, what became very popular for a while is to apply Fourier binning first. Then you get nice 2D sinograms and then apply OSEM instead of FBP, because 2D OSEM is doable even if you have not so powerful computers. And uh, the, the images look a lot nicer if you OSEM them than if you uh, make them with the background. Okay, and so this, this was implemented on all uh, clinical pet systems of all vendors. And I think it's still there on most systems. But it's being replaced now with fully 3D uh, uh, OSEM or, or other flavors of iterative algorithm because they provide still better data and because the computers are now powerful enough to do that. 